Johnson, uh, a voice from Johnson & Johnson, uh, who can fill us in on where the company is regarding a potential uh, vaccine. Joining us now, uh, Dr. Paul Stoffels, and he is Chief Science Office, Scientific Officer and Vice Chairman of the Executive Committee at Johnson & Johnson. He joins us uh, now uh, from Amsterdam, so we'll uh, try not to talk over each other with a long delay. Uh, doctor, but w w you, you uh, do you have a feel now whether it's possible to create a vaccine that would be available and ma and you could manufacture enough of to deal with this Wuhan version of the coronavirus? Yeah, we are comfortable that we can create a vaccine and scale it up. Um, we have done this uh, in Ebola in six months from having a construct virus to uh, scaling it up and bringing it to humans. With Zika, we have done it in 12 months where we did not have the virus and we had to start from scratch. Here we are in the same situation as Zika. We have to start from a sequence which we now know and are building the viruses. We are going to take an approach, a parallel approach with at least five different constructs with different parts partners, collaborators over the world in order to see which, which vaccine, which part of the virus we can use to make an effective vaccine. In parallel, this, the, uh, this developing an animal model where we can test it in, and in parallel also starting the upscaling. We have a platform, an Adeno platform, Adeno 26, which has been used in all of these. And at the moment, we have used it in more than 20,000 people already for vaccination. We have an exceptional upscaling platform where within uh, one year, in one year, we can produce up to 300 million vaccines if we would find one, uh, which is really active. So first, find a vaccine and prove that it works. In parallel, we'll start the upscaling process and do the big kickoff for the multi-million uh, upscaling if, uh, if we find one. The, uh, obviously, the, these viruses mutate a lot. Is there, is there something on the surface of the virus you would look at that's conserved that, that would, would not mutate as, uh, as time goes forward? Is there a way to do that? Because it seems like these things find a way to mutate around um, therapeutics and vaccine. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what we do. That's why we make multiple constructs to evaluate in animal models. Uh, and that's why we have to uh, take a cautionary approach that it might it, not all vaccines might work. And that's why we do multiple. Uh, it might mutate, but we look at conserved sites uh, with the scientists we have, and we have mobilized uh, internal and external already dozens of scientists who are working on this. So we are pretty confident that we can get something made which will work and which stay active for the longer term. Um, and so we, uh, we will see in the next few weeks uh, how that goes. Dr. Stoffels, you mentioned that six-month difference between Zika and Ebola being basically that you had um, access to the virus itself in Ebola versus having to work from the sequence with Zika. And you said that's the situation here. But since we have five cases in the United States, and the CDC says it's um, working to make samples available to academic labs uh, of the virus, potentially, I mean, could you... Uh, get access to um, those isolates to be able to work from that and cut down uh, the number of months it takes to advance the work? No, well, what we had in Ebola is that we'd, we had been working already for several years on a vaccine together with, with the U.S. government, with BARDA, with different organizations, because the virus was known already for 20 years from, from DRC. And that's where we started from an actual vaccine, which we had on the shelf to upscale it and do, the, do all the work to get it into humans and test it out. Here we start from a sequence, and that's why this uh, delay is longer than with Ebola. But we'll, uh, we have good hopes that we can further accelerate it uh, because uh, since we have now the sequence, uh, we have new technologies to, sequence, to, to produce these antigens and to make the different constructs. Maybe we can cut off another two or three months, depending. Uh, but uh, we, we better first do it be before we promise. Mm -hmm. the, <clears throat> the actual production of large volumes of the vaccine, it, it, are we at a point in... in molecular biology now where, where we can do it and manufacture it, or do we still do it in that cumbersome way with, with what, eggs or the way we used to do it? It would take forever. How would this vaccine be, be manufactured and scaled up, doctor? 
Yeah, our platform, we have, uh, we have a vaccine platform where the, the vector is adapted to the platform. And in Ebola, we produced in within one month two million vaccine in a small vessel of 10, 20 liters. Here now, we have upscaled that platform to the point that we can produce in a very dense cell platform. It's, it's using cells in, uh, in, in vessels. We, in 1,000 liter, we have calculated now, and we have done it already, that we can, for other vaccines, that we can get up to... Um, hundreds of millions, uh, up to 300 million in a thousand liter vessel. So we have fully optimized that that platform, and that gives us confidence that ultimately, if we have a vaccine, we will be able to make it in large quantity. I understand therapeutically that the Tamiflu is is ineffective, but uh, the the uh, virus is similar in certain ways to HIV, and that protease inhibitors might be uh, helpful to. to um, maybe lessen the, the mortality rate? Do you know? Yeah. That there should be plenty, of, there should be a lot of that available, I would think, uh, since it's manufactured already. E Yes, absolutely. We also have developed uh, um, Prezistime Prescobix and uh, protease inhibitor for HIV, which is available in China on the market. And we have been in contact with the Shanghai Public Health Center, and, uh, and they will start evaluating it right now. We have already provided them with the medicine, or it is being provided today, to start that evaluation. It were, it's some preliminary data, so we need to be careful that, that we don't overhype it yet until we really have clinical outcomes. In parallel, we are looking into the lab, and uh, we have made contact over the weekend to start screening our libraries of, of, um, of uh, drugs into uh, screens where we normally can measure quite well whether a drug is active on a virus, yes or no. And that is in parallel happening. And we'll broaden Dr. that Stavos. to other drugs, for example, RSV drugs and other molecules, yeah. nucleus. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask you briefly if you could help us put into context um, how yes. you're looking at this outbreak. In your experience in infectious disease, how concerned are you as you're seeing how it's spreading? Well, I, I'm quite concerned, um, but with SARS, we learned that with good control measures, the disease could get under control. That's why I think China is doing the right thing and the whole world is doing the right thing to make sure that they isolate the patients who are infected. Um, it's quite scary that it uh, was is going so fast, so broad in the world. Um, so we shouldn't create panic, but at the same time, very, uh, very worried that this could become a global pandemic and therefore take all precautions. And and so that's also okay. why we started working on the vaccines to vaccine two weeks right. ago. We have to be prepared for the event that this is going to get to a global crisis. Yeah. Okay, Dr. It's dangerous for elderly people and for children, yeah. most probably for vulnerable people. Yes, yes. All right, Dr. Safo, thank you. And um, we wish you the best, and uh, we appreciate uh, coming to us from Amsterdam uh, this morning. That's where thank they're doing the work. Right. Thank you, Meg.